Good evening. Welcome to the Korea Society's live webcast. I'm Jail, the Arts and Culture Director of the Korea Society. And we're coming to you live from my kitchen. Like many of you, the staff of the Korea Society are working from home, but we are as committed as ever to continue our mission and we'll do so by bringing our program to your home, either as live webcast or pre-recorded programs, all of which you can view or listen at your convenience. To those essential workers, if you're watching, we just want to say thank you for all you do. And to everyone, we hope you are all healthy and safe. And we thank you for joining us tonight during this challenging time. And tonight, we are thrilled to welcome back Chef Huni Kim to the Korea Society, chef and owner of critically acclaimed and widely popular restaurants, Tanji and Hanjan in New York City. The New York Times has heralded Chef Huni Kim as the citizen leading interpreter of Korean cuisine. And as many of you know, he has been operating delivery service during this pause in the city. He's also the founder of Yori Chansa, a nonprofit in Korea, and his long awaited cookbook, My Korea Traditional Flavors, Modern Recipes, was just published by W.W. Norton. And if you can, you can order it from anywhere you can buy a book. So if you haven't, you can order it right after this live webcast. Chef Huni Kim is joined tonight by our special guest, Andrew Friedman, award-winning cookbook author, and also the author of the book, Chefs, Drugs, and Rock and Roll, How Food Lovers, Free Spirits, Misfits, and Wanderers Created a New American Profession. He's also the host of the popular podcast, Andrew Talks to Chefs, which is available wherever you get your own podcasts. And we're grateful to have him as a moderator tonight. Welcome to the Korea Society, gentlemen. Thank you. Hi. I have to say, um, when we first conceived this program earlier this year, um, it was supposed to be our usual program in our event space in front of the live audience. And when it became pretty clear to everybody that we're not going to be able to do that on April 30th, Andrew was the first one to reach out to all of us and said he's willing to try any format and do the program in order to support Chef Huni Kim and the Korea Society. So we just want to say thank you, Andrew. Um, we are also accepting your questions for Chef Huni Kim. You can tweet your questions at Korea Society Art or send us a question via email to artsandculture at koreasociety.org. Okay, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for that introduction. Hello, Chef. How are you tonight? Hi, Andrew. I'm doing good. <laughs> good. Um, well, you know, before we talk about your book, which, you know, we spoke a little bit earlier and, you know, I love this book that you've, you've written. Um, I thought maybe it would be appropriate to talk a little bit about this moment that we find ourselves in. Uh, obviously, in the midst of this pandemic, we're I think, um, you know, closer to two months in now than we are to one month in. Mm. What, uh, you know, restaurants have been responding to this in all kinds of different ways in the short term. Uh, mm. Jay just mentioned something that anybody who follows your Instagram and maybe some of your customers know, because you've been doing it for a while, the way you've been pivoting, I guess, is the verb that we now use. Um, but can you talk a little bit about what you've been doing to sort of adjust and to keep your business going as much as you've been able to in the in the midst of this? Yeah, um, you know, when we were initially uh, made to shut down, I think many chef owners, um, we just reacted. Um, we had rent that was due, we had staff that we had to pay. So, um, you know, my initial thought was, how do I generate revenue? Uh, and I was fortunate that my menu at my restaurants, it's more towards traditional Korean food and traditional Korean food sits well in the fridge. And having um, a child and living with a family of my own, I was sort of getting sick of delivering, ordering food every single day, twice, three times a day. So, you know, my idea was create uh, a meal kit for a, a family of two or three or even four that can last two, three days. Um, and, you know, that way we could deliver ourselves because it is a little bit more expensive and we're not delivering $20, $30 meals. We're delivering $135 meals and we only have to deliver to a family once a week. Uh, we thought that this could at least generate a little bit of revenue, uh, so I can hire a few of my managers. 
We started first day selling 10, extremely happy. End of that first week, we sold uh, a total of 80 that week. Um, every day, every week, we sold more. Uh, and now we're up to 170 a week. Uh, and we sell out every week. It's, I've been lucky. Uh, most restaurants aren't as lucky as us because their food doesn't hold well in a, in a refrigerator. But, um, you know, I think I talked to a lot of my friends and it was just, we reacted. We, this wasn't, I got lucky. A lot of my other chef friends, not so much. Um, I think a lot of restaurants did the delivery for a month and decided to close because financially they were losing money, uh, losing more money every day, opening the restaurant. So, um, you know, it's, it's tough, uh, but I what, consider myself lucky. What's your, I mean, nobody has a crystal ball. Uh, it seems to me like the biggest frustration amongst the chefs and owners that I speak to right now is the absolute lack of a date certain for reopening or even partial reopening. Uh, what, what to you is, are the variables that are going to determine how, let's just keep it to New York since that's where you operate. Mm. What's going to determine how, how restaurants come out of this situation? Do you think it's going to be a matter of lo how long it takes or do you think there are too many other factors to even predict? Um, to be honest, I've thought a lot about this. The opening date doesn't really matter. Um, most New York City restaurants, uh, we jam people in. That's sort of the attraction of New York City restaurants where you're close to strangers. You could see what they're eating. You could hear their comments about the food and the experience. And unfortunately, because of this virus, we are now uncomfortable and it's not safe to do that. So it really doesn't matter when the city allows us to open. Um, I think the vaccine is going to be the only thing. And I, even after the vaccine, just having people comfortable again, being close to strangers, that might take more. That might take a lot longer than the vaccine. Um, you know, just mathematically, uh, financially, it does not make sense when we have to social distance in our restaurant. Dandy, for instance, has 36 seats in a 600 square foot space to give each customer social distancing it would have to be cut down to 12 seats. You know, being forgiven for rent doesn't matter anymore at that time. Um, we won't be able to pay our staff members. We, it's just not going to be financially feasible uh, for us to open. And I think most, and, I'm, and I mean most, I mean 80, 90% of New York City restaurants are in the same boat as mine, except for maybe the fine dining restaurants where they, there's a lot of space. And it's going to be unfortunate because then you're limited to really expensive restaurants and, you know, fast food restaurants. And that's not what New York City is about. Yeah. Well, thanks for your honesty on all that. And obviously none of most of the people who are now doing takeaway, you know, or delivery, it's, that's not really what you guys got into this for, right? You got into it. it it's not. Right. And, and the pleasure of seeing your customers enjoying what you do and being in your space. And that's the most spiritually sort of devastating thing because we cook the food to, you know, wish us, we cook. But the whole purpose is to make people happy at our restaurant. And it's great for us to be able to see that, feel it, feel the energy and have them thank you when they leave for a delicious meal and a good time. We're not able to do that. Um, what does help a little bit is when our customers post on Instagram about the food that, you know, the food that we delivered, them trying to warm it up. <laughs> um, you know, that makes me happy, but it's, it's different. It's, it's not the same. It's a connection, but it's not the same connection. Not the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's move on to a happier topic. Can I, I hope people can see this is your book. <laughs> I love yeah. this book. It has, you can't see this over the internet, but it has real heft to it. There's tremendous value here. Uh, it's a happy beautiful book. It's a beautiful book. Um, I have to tell you, Huni, I don't think you know this, but the, you know, I live in the suburbs just north of New York City and Hastings on Hudson. And my last New York City meal before mm -hmm. today was lunch at, Don, at uh, Donji. Oh, really? On Wednesday, March 11th. Yes, I had, I had a oh. morning lunch there with somebody. And okay. it turns out that's the last, I haven't been in the city since then. Wow. Um, I only live 18 miles away, but for obvious reasons, I haven't been in. 
Um, but I was struck that my first meal I ever had at one of your restaurants was right after you first opened Hanjan. A okay. chef, chef named Gavin Kazin, who was a fellow oh. of, <laughs> of the Daniel Balud empire, as you mm -hmm. are, mm -hmm. that a friend of mine just opened a restaurant. I want to go check it out. And we came in and the first thing I ever ate, and it's something I always order when I go to Hanjan, are the rice cakes, the spicy rice cakes. Mm. Uh, which I find addictive and, and they, they live in my memory. I can taste them as I'm talking about them. <laughs> and I was struck that in the book, you talk about your first memory being rice cakes. First uh, taste memory. Taste yes. memory rather, yeah. Mm. Can you just talk mm. about that moment and, and, and how, why it was so formative for you? Um, I will be quite honest and say, I have forgotten about that sort of instinct for close to 30 years. Um, it's after I became a chef and after I started learning more about Korean cuisine, going back to Korea uh, to, to, to research, that I really started thinking back and further back and really just sort of thought, why am I a Korean chef? Why should I be a Korean chef? What, you know, I was given this advice when I was a, a, a cook at one of uh, another, a, a different restaurant. Um, and the chef basically told me, when you're ready to open up a restaurant, you have to open up a restaurant that, look yourself in the mirror and you have to open up a restaurant that looks like you, that feels like you. Um, and when your customers come to see your restaurant, when you're not there, they have to feel you. I looked, I looked at myself in the mirror, I saw a Korean guy. Uh, so that's why I became a Korean chef. Uh, but, you know, I never really lived in Korea. I moved away when I was two. Uh, I visited quite often. So I had to keep, you know, I had to really search in my memory. Um, what, why would I, why should I be a Korean chef? And how is that the right thing to do? Um, and ultimately it came down to one thing. Um, while cooking at Danielle and while cooking at Masa, I was able to cook with very talented French and Japanese chefs. And while they were cooking, they were cooking with the same kind of intensity that I was and technique that I was cooking, but they had this national pride. They were cooking their culture. They were making their country proud by cooking this beautiful, delicious food. And I never got to experience that at Danielle or at Masa. I wanted to experience that. I wanted to be a proud Korean chef. So that's why I opened up the Korean restaurants Danji and Hanjang. Uh, and I just had to really search deep inside my memory um, of, of, of experiences, instances that would help me become a Korean chef. And that's when I started remembering the, the first experiences of Korean food. Wow. So it was there, but you just hadn't called it, hadn't, you hadn't called it up. Surprisingly, yes. Amazing. Um, you know, it wasn't even just those two stories. Um, it was many, many stories that, that helped, you know, opening my restaurant helped me remember. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that's a good segue. You know, you just mentioned, um, uh, well, you mentioned everything that weaves into the next question I had for you. You mentioned your, your training and some of the more sophisticated, high-end, uh, well-regarded restaurants in New York, Danielle and mm -hmm. Masa. Uh, you mentioned moving away from home when you were two. Initially, you moved to the UK, and then eventually you moved to the US. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the book is called My Korea. And mm. in the very, uh, I think, open, honest, revealing introductory section, the autobiographical section up front, there is a section called My Food, My Korea. Mm. And there's a little passage here that I love, and I'd love you to just expand on it if you would. Okay. My food is what you might get from a Korean grandmother if she went to culinary school, interned at high-end Michelin restaurants, and settled in New York City, and perhaps had an addiction to White Castle sliders. <laughs> That's quite a breadth of references uh, to describe one's own food. It makes total sense to me having eaten your food a lot. But can you just expand on that a little bit? A, a simple explanation would be, it, that's, just, that's who I am. You know, um, I love uh, traditional uh, old style Korean food that my mother or my grandmother would cook for me if I lived in Korea. Um, I still believe that the best chefs in Korea are not 
the chefs at restaurants, it's the mothers who cook for their families. And that truly defines Korean food for me. I think many uh, countries, many different cuisines, uh, the, the sort of history of their cuisine was built through restaurants. Definitely France with these famous uh, encyclopedic books and famous chefs, they made French food what it is now. Uh, and many countries it's like that. Whereas Korea, we really didn't even have restaurants for, for a long because it was war torn. Uh, we never had chefs. Um, the whole sort of fine dining is very new to us. But the people who really um, brought the tradition and continue uh, the, the growth of Korean cuisine were the moms cooking at home. And the way the moms cook, very different than the way chefs cook. Um, moms, it's all about nutrition. It's about a healthy family. So they buy ingredients that are nutritious and healthy, and then they make it taste delicious because they want their children and the family to eat more of it to become healthy. So it's nutritious first, delicious second, where it's completely different than a French chef or any restaurant chef owner because they don't really care as much about the health where it has to be delicious so these customers come, keep coming back for the restaurant to generate revenue. That's for me, it's the antithesis of Korean food. Um, and that's why, and that's how I differentiate Korean cuisine um, to the other you know, ethnic cuisines or other national cuisines. Um, the, the thing about the Michelin, uh, uh, interning at Michelin restaurant, I learned how to cook from, I think, the best chefs in the United States still. Uh, um, and I learned about technique. I learned about uh, the importance of ingredients. Uh, and, you know, cooking with technique hasn't always been the strong suit in Korean cuisine. If you, you know, I have a lot of Korean cookbooks and with Korean cookbooks, they never do measurements because we're, we're not used to cooking in ovens. There is no 325 degrees uh, uh, and, and there's no clocks. There's no, and, and the best question, um, the best answer for some, some of these questions, like how much salt do you put in? And the answer would be uh, to the point where it's not too salty. You know, uh, it's a pinch of this, it just enough of that. Um, and that's just the way Koreans cook because a lot of Korean ingredients are alive. Um, soy sauces, the salinity, each brand is different. Um, even denjang, uh, you know, some denjang you put one scoop in that's good enough for soup. Sometimes you have to put a, a pint in. So, you know, what I wanted to do with my book is just put a, make it a little bit more specific. Um, and I do that with my restaurants too, where this technique is very, um, classical and classical, not in Korean, but very classical uh, European uh, technique. Um, and then the last part about sliders is I grew up in New York. As, as Korean as I think as I am, I'm a New Yorker. And when I opened Danji, it really was, I wasn't pretending to be a Korean chef. I was a New York chef um, sharing with the diners what I thought Korean food could be in New York. Uh, and that's where that paragraph came about or how it came about. Well, it's funny. You just talked about home cooking and, um, you know, the place it holds in, in Korean uh, uh, culinary culture. Mm. Um, you know, this cookbook, it's funny that you said, you know, how oftentimes you'll see a recipe in Korea and there's not, you know, there's not cooking times and temperatures. Um, this book is incredibly detailed. The recipes mm. are incredibly detailed. Um, mm. You know, part of me suspects you, you worked with a rather famous editor by the name of Maria Guarnaschelli, <laughs> who, yes. is, who is, her daughter is a little more famous than she is. She mm. is Alex Guarnaschelli's mom. Uh, mm. But Maria is known for producing and editing cookbooks that do have this kind of, you know, loving, evocative, almost, uh, you know, I think as, as as close to being there on the page as you can be without a video or mm -hmm. you know an instructor next to you. But can you speak a little to, and obviously you also had a collaborator, Aki Komozawa. Mm -hmm. uh, can you speak to the process of writing the book? And also a lot of chefs are almost allergic to that level of detail in cookbooks um, because they feel it should be more intuitive. I started this book in 2013. So it's seven years since it was, uh, it took seven years to be published. My first uh, manuscript was 
turned down um, because it wasn't detailed enough. My second manuscript was also turned down, uh, both by Maria, because she just said it wasn't good enough. And the first two manuscripts, I, I was, there weren't many Korean cookbooks at that time. Uh, Mang Chi hadn't published hers yet. <laughs> so, you know, my role was to introduce Korean flavors and I wasn't good at that. And I didn't want to do that because Korean food is so much more complex and there's so much more detail going into, um, you know, the philosophy of Korean food. And this didn't come out in the introduction of Korean food uh, in my book. But fortunately, there have been since you know, I first attempted to write the book, there's been many, many very good Korean cookbooks um, who played a really, played that role of introducing Korean food to a lot of the readers. So my third attempt at getting this manuscript accepted was I took that basic knowledge to the next level. Um, it's, it's not a beginner's, cookbook. It's not an introduction to Korean food. It's, it's an advanced um, historical, philosophical, it, it really goes down to the ingredients and, and, and the understanding of fermentation and all of that, which I think is what makes Korean food so special. Uh, and that I had fun with. That I was able to tell the stories that uh, Maria uh, enjoyed. And ultimately, uh, after Maria retired, Melanie Tortoroli uh, took over and she took us uh, to the finish line. Um, yeah, it was a seven year process. And I, I have to thank Maria because I thought my first two manuscripts were good enough. I mean, they weren't excellent, they weren't great, but they were good enough to be published, uh, but she wouldn't let me, she wouldn't allow me. And I am so much more proud of this book than my first two manuscripts that, you know, I have to thank her. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, I like I said, I think it's wonderful. I mean, I've never, I, it's the first book that I think I've probably had that tackles Korean food where I thought, okay, because I know you say it's not, uh, you know, a basic book or a, you know, really a primer on, on Korean food, but you do spend a lot of time up front talking about the basics and Zhang's and, you know, all these, you do mm. sort of give, I, I feel like you kind of, there's that old line that artists, um, you know, first you learn, learn the rules and then you break them. I feel uh -huh. like- both in this book like you sort of explain the rules and mm. then you follow some of them but you also break some <laughs> um yeah um i think the biggest difference between my book and the other cookbooks um uh, not only do i explain about the korean jangs i explain the difference between a good jang and a bad jang um i i, I let you know where to buy the good jangs and i tell you explain why it's so much, why it's so worth it. Um, I know a lot of my friends who I've taught to sort of cook this way, uh, using these artisanal ingredients. And I'm sure they're much poorer now because <laughs> these ingredients are more expensive. But, you know, ultimately Korean food is about, like I said before, making you healthier. Every meal should make you more healthy. And I let you know how through this book. Um, yeah. So you, you know, to that point, um, you know, I was really struck as important as I know ingredients are, and as important as I know, you just talked about the healthy aspect. Mm. Uh, you really do commit to this in the book. You know, I was struck reading about uh, in your section on kimchi, and mm. I'm going to read another little passage here. Uh, when you make kimchi, try to find organically grown vegetables that are not contaminated by pesticides or other chemicals. Koreans believe that such chemicals hinder fermentation mm. and slow the growth of probiotic bacteria. I also recommend using spring water instead of tap water. Mm -hmm. And as mentioned above, salt from the Andes or Himalayas. Mm -hmm. These mountain salts have less contamination from man-made chemicals. It is almost impossible to make 100% organic kimchi, but the cleaner your ingredients, the better your end product. Now, mm. you, know, you look at something like kimchi, which mm -hmm. to look at it seems 
you know, you talked about home cooking and it seems like a product of that background, right? It doesn't seem like something that's terribly fussy, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't mean fussy in a derogatory way. I guess I should say that's that precise, right? Mm -hmm. But I read this and of course it makes sense to me because the best coffee I've ever had has been when I've been camping and I had, you know, I got water out of a stream and it was fresh and your coffee tastes better, you know? Mm -hmm. um, well, can you just, I mean, this level of commitment to me is quite striking. Do you find that most people are surprised to find that in your recipe? Um, you know, it's what I've been practicing at my restaurants for all this time. And it's something that I can't put on the menu. Uh, people can taste it uh, and they can, they definitely taste the difference. Um, but now I, I'm able to explain why it tastes different. Um, I know Korean restaurants serve kimchi for free. Um, many do. And because of that, they can't ferment uh, properly because that's just like throwing money away. Uh, so kimchi, in, especially in this country, it, it's not very delicious most of the time. Um, so, you know, this book basically tells you, teaches you how to really make kimchi that you would taste if you were, uh, if you had a Korean grandmother who lived in Korea and you were visiting her home. It's, and, and let me, one of the biggest reasons for me to write this book was definitely to explain a little bit about my restaurant, but my ultimate goal is for people who read it and buy the book to have this curiosity to visit Korea. Um, I mean, I'm not a, a, a Korean ambassador or anything, but I do feel like anybody who visits a certain country to study the culture, experience the people, they come um, respecting that culture, that country a little bit more. Um, and I think, you know, Koreans or any, any country needs it and, and wants that. But I think through this book, um, I, I do want more and more people to visit Korea to, to learn more about our culture and to, to understand why many of us are hot-headed, uh, you know, uh, and why Korean restaurants now are the way they are, where a lot of this stuff is free, a lot of the portions are more than you can finish, because that is the Pujin culture that we have in Korea, where uh, the more we give, the better we feel. Um, yeah, so that's another reason for you to buy the book yeah. to want to come to Korea. Well, along those lines again, uh, you know, your photographer, Kristen Teague, you and I spoke. Mm. You and I spoke. Kristen uh, Teague. Teague. Teague, excuse yeah, me. She always corrects me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, That's okay. So, um, you know, you told me something interesting when I told you how beautiful I thought the book was, which was mm. that it was her first time visiting Korea to shoot the book. Yes. And I, I, it's, I mean, I would hold it up. It won't really translate through the lens, but it mm -hmm. is very, it's a very beautiful book. You know, there's shots mm -hmm. of you in restaurants where you really get a sense of kind of the, whether the restaurant, you know, like the, the cramp space, the dim lighting, the, mm -hmm. the, the bounty on the table. And then there are shots at processing facilities of various things uh, mm -hmm. where there are these beautiful wide shots where you're almost overwhelmed by it. I mean, it's, mm. it's a very, it's a, it's a very unique looking cookbook in a, in a mm. really great way. But can you, what do you think was the benefit of having a photographer who, to your point, was making her first trip to this place you want people to visit? So Kristen, um, I had never met her before. She, did, she didn't come recommended. Uh, nobody recommended her. My wife and I, we went to a Barnes and Noble and went through hundreds and hundreds of books, picked a few out that we really liked the photography and, 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 you know, pictures that told stories. And one of them happened to be Kristen. Uh, I met her the night before we started taking pictures in Korea. She arrived at 11 p.m. We had a 7 a.m. Uh, train the next day. It was her first trip. Um, just said hello. Next day, we went down to Busan from Seoul. Uh, somebody picked us up. And her first meal in Korea it was it was this restaurant that served two dishes, well one dish, two different styles. Hejangkuk, basically a uh, a hangover soup, and your choices were um, you could have either pork blood or pork intestine. And she asked, "What do you think?" <laughs> and I said, "I'll have the blood. You have the intestine." 
and we both finished it off. And, and from there, um, we hadn't really discussed too much about the book, uh, but every discussion that we sort of had, I, I trusted her. I mean, if you can eat, you know, as your first meal, breakfast, uh, an intestine, a spicy intestine soup, then, then you have accepted this culture. You're living this culture. So take pictures of whatever you want, because that's what I want in the book. Great. Um, let me just ask you quickly one or two uh, specific dishes, and then we'll go to the questions uh, mm. that people sent in ahead of time. Um, can you just, um, you know, again, it's called My Korea, so I'm, I just want to ask you about one or two that are specific to you. Okay. Uh, the beef brisket bulgogi sliders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So can you, I mean, you make this comment, you make it sound like such a minor change, you know, normally served in lettuce cups, you shift to brioche buns. Uh, but yes. that's, I think you say, the best-selling dish at Donji. Um, what's the, uh, how'd that come about? Well, White Castle sliders have always been my vice. I, I grew up eating White Castle sliders. Uh, you know, from K-Town to my home in Manhattan, um, I could wolf down about 13 sliders. And sort of, I would time myself. And, and I knew exactly when I was close to home, you know, I would, have eaten 13. Um, so I had this love for sliders. Uh, when I was opening Danji, it was not near K-Town. Um, it was in, an, in the neighborhood, there weren't any Korean restaurants. Uh, I had to play a role of introducing Korean flavors. But as you said, bulgogi, you know, even for you, it's difficult to pronounce, right? So I had to make it, I had to make Korean food less exotic. You know, at least sound less, less exotic because I knew the flavors I could win people over. Um, so instead of uh, doing a bulgogi, the traditional way with lettuce cups, which is still foreign for most Americans, uh, I put it in between uh, buns. And, you know, you call anything a slider. People are okay with sliders. You know, you could serve goat testicles inside a slider and people go, oh, sliders. Um, so that was my strategy of, of getting my diners to to experience these traditional Korean flavors, but the vehicle would be more accessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Okay, and then I also wanted to ask you about um, spicy pork and gokujan with bolognese noodles. <laughs> this yeah. is another one to me when I, you know, I, I think back to that passage from the opening of the book and this to me, is again, not every, a lot of things in the books lean far more traditional or even strictly uh -huh. traditional than this, but mm. I'd love for you to just comment on that dish. It, it's actually even now quite common uh, for a lot of um, Korean chefs to replace anything kimchi or kochujang with tomato and also foreign chefs as well. Uh, they, they, instead of a tomato based sauce, they will replace it with a kochujang or a kimchi uh, these days. Um, it may be the color, it may be the acidity, um, but, you know, it just, it just makes sense. Um, you know, making a ragu, I, I do at home. I cook a lot of Italian at home. Uh, and just to replace it with something traditionally Korean, I thought my diners, this was only a lunch menu, um, where, you know, they are a lot less, um, adventurous. And, and it's funny because you, this dish sounds very adventurous, you know, this, this fusion uh, technique, but not so much when, when it looks like a bolognese and it tastes like kimchi. So those are dishes that I have fun with. Um, I, those are dishes that sort of help me develop as a chef. I am a much different chef now. <laughs> I, I enjoy cooking a lot more traditional Korean food now, but like I said before, when Danji first opened, I was not as Korean as I am now. I was, you know, my Korean wasn't even that good. My language skills weren't that good. And my thinking was very American at that time. And, you know, that dish uh, at that time was who I was. Uh, and that's why it's in the book. Yeah. Well, as you said, you are a New Yorker, right? And have been since you yeah. were so, <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I hope some people have been tweeting in questions as we've been speaking. I do have some questions that people sent in before we came on tonight, and I'm going to ask mm. some of these. 
Linda asks, what are the five must have Asian ingredients one should have in their kitchen? I guess we should say probably Korean ingredients would be um, you. Yeah, I would say all three changs, which would be gochujang, ganjang, and uh, uh, denjang, which are uh, fermented soybean paste, uh, red, red pepper paste, and soy sauce. Now I would say 99% of Korean uh, dishes have one of those three or two, or even all three in it. So those three um, I get from Korea. I also get uh, sesame oil from Korea. And I also get gochugaru, which is red pepper flakes. I think those five ingredients, if you have, if you're able to access really good, uh, those five ingredients, then your Korean food's gonna taste so much better than if you buy those ingredients at like a, a generic supermarket, mass produced ingredients. Uh, and that's for me, the only difference between my restaurant and the Koreatown restaurants. Uh, it's those five ingredients are different. I, I use different garlic and better produce and better meat and everything. But um, a lot of the times you can't taste the difference, but definitely the changs and the sesame oil and the gochukaru, you could taste the difference. Uh, and it's not like we're better cooks or anything. It's just our ingredients are better. Uh, and more authentic. And that's when you can really taste the feel authenticism, authenticism in food. It is because of those five ingredients, Korean ingredients. Thank mm. you. Uh, this is a non book question, but something about yourself. You manage two restaurants in New York City. You appear on television in Korea. You wrote a book. You do some significant volunteering work. I've seen a lot of different activities you've done. How do you manage your time and balance your personal Life and Family asks, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, questioner, Sung Won, B-Y-U-N. <laughs> you know, my wife should be watching this because she thinks I'm the laziest person in the world. <laughs> um, there's a lot of hours in a day. There's a lot of, you know, days in a year. Um, I still try to get eight hours of sleep. Um, I still eat two meals a day. Um, you know, I don't play golf anymore, of course. Um, but you know, I love, I, I live food. I live my restaurants. Uh, I, I love helping, um, children who are, uh, less fortunate. Uh, and, and I don't consider them jobs. I just consider these activities who I am. And, and I love, uh, going to Korea on a, a, a TV company's dime. Uh, you know, having them put me up on a hotel, you know, working at a TV studio for a couple of hours, and then eating and researching Korean food the rest of the time. For me, that, you know, it's not a job. It's, it's going to, uh, it's taking a course in Korean culinary for free and getting paid for it, actually. So I've been fortunate uh, with, with taking up projects that I'm very passionate about and that I would be doing if even if I wasn't getting paid, I would probably pay to do because so many people consider cooking a hobby, right? But they have to buy all these ingredients. Uh, so it costs money, it's not cheap to cook, uh, but I get paid to do that. And how special is that? Great. Um, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then I'm gonna turn it over to Jay who has I think some live questions that have been coming in. What, um, for people who are just starting to cook Korean food, what are some of the easier dishes that they might tackle first? And that question comes from Wendy Lee. Mm. Um, definitely the banchan and the muchim. Uh, when you get into the kimchi, um, it involves fermentation. And whenever it involves fermentation, there's this time that, that has to pass. And then there's, you have to know when the fermentation has started and what amount of fermentation that you'd like in your food. Um, and then when the fermentation has stopped and is now uh, started decomposing, you have to know because <laughs> you don't want to be eating rotten food. Um, I will tell you this, the biggest difference between when there's fermentation and fermentation has stopped and then it started decomposing is the texture. When you have kimchi, where the texture of the cabbage starts, it's mushy, it is not fermenting anymore. Fermenting has long passed and it's starting to rot. Uh, you could still probably eat uh, some of it without it upsetting your stomach, but the, the valuable probiotics isn't there anymore. Um, so, you know, stuff, stuff like this is very difficult. 
But definitely the panchans and the muchims where it's instantaneous. Um, and, you know, learning the, the balance of sweet, garlic, salty, uh, the acid and all of that with these quick panchans where you can adjust uh, instantaneously and, and notice the difference. I think that's, that's a very good way. Um, and with panchan, you can make two or three and it'll last you three, four, five, six days. Um, and all you need is a bowl of warm rice. And you can always take panchan out of uh, the refrigerator and, and have a nice meal. So yeah, I would start with that. For just before I turn it over to Jay, uh, Huni, the, um, just for people who don't know, I know we are at the Korea Society, but uh, can you, banchan, how would we define this for people who aren't familiar Banchan's with that? Side dishes? Yeah, it's, it's the little small side dishes that are usually room temperature or cold. Uh, we keep it in the fridge that every Korean meal um, has. Um, it, it's, there is no equivalence in, in Western cuisine. Uh, maybe a metze uh, in, in Middle Eastern or, uh, but you know, every Korean meal has banchan and it includes kimchi, it includes the muchims. It, mostly it's vegetables or fish that's been pickled, cured, um, or just sauteed. Um, yeah, and you know, sometimes you'll go visit a Korean family and they'll bust 20 out right off the bat. Beauty Great. of Korean food. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jay, over to you. Great. Um, Puni, we have lots of questions coming in. I what? have a question from Helen from Birmingham, Alabama. Wow. He okay. asks, what do you think distinguishes your restaurant and style from other New York Korean restaurants? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's the ingredients. Um, we are not a fancy restaurant. We are, uh, you know, definitely not fine dining. Um, all of our plates are pretty cheap. Uh, we don't have expensive stemware or flatware. Um, our decor didn't cost a lot of money. Our service is very friendly, but the ingredients are better than most fine dining restaurants. And for me, you know, I don't, I really do not like using chemical additives to help my food. Mm -hmm. um, as a chef, I'm, I consider that cheating almost because, uh, you know, it, what's the difference between an athlete injecting yourself with steroids when I can use MSG without any work to make the food taste better? No difference. Um, so, you know, it's these chemical additives that I try to stay away from. Uh, and it's the special ingredients, uh, especially the ones that I do bring from Korea. I think that makes my restaurant very, sp there's only a few restaurants in this country that uses those ingredients. So um, yeah, that would be the major difference. Great. And speaking of uh, chemical additives, um, mm. actually, there are a lot of people who are asking about mm. gluten-free issues, mm. soy-free. Um, mm. There's a question from Nicole who was asking, what substitute I could use if gukkanjang, you know, mm -hmm. the chojangkanjang, is yeah. not, quote-unquote, the cleanest product, i.e. plant-based, so it's hard finding that full flavor with a broth made of Kombu and shiitake, soy sauce doesn't seem to do what kukkanjang does. So do you have any specific suggestions? Yeah, yeah. You, you get get traditional kukkanjang or traditional kanjang where it, it has no um, a wheat. It is brewed naturally. I think that's the key word. When something is brewed naturally and, and the fermentation is many, many years, uh, then not only is it healthy, but that that strong sort of uh, finishing flavor is natural. Um, it's not cheap, but kukkanjan was never supposed to be cheap. I know you can buy it at a supermarket, like what, $4 a liter. That's not real. That's not real traditional kukkanjan. Traditional kukkanjan has to go through a natural fermentation. And natural fermentation doesn't mean putting like koji in and having it ferment for three days. The mm -hmm. kukkanjan that we use at Tanjian Hanjan, it's seven years old. Uh, and and can I recommend a place where you can buy it? Sure, absolutely. Uh, you can't buy this at, at most supermarkets because it's just too expensive, but you can buy it online now, which you couldn't two years ago. Uh, right. But these days you can buy it at kimcmarket.com. Yes. And it's in the book. Uh, there's a lot of places that you can buy it. Um, and, and these, you know, the, the traditionally brewed kukkanjangs is the way to go. 
Uh, right. They are gluten free, just Korean soy sauce by nature is gluten free, but not these days. All the mass produced ones are not. Mm -hmm. But let's, yeah, let's use these artisanal ingredients because that'll make you a much better chef. <laughs> How about gochujang? Can gochujang be gluten free? Most of it is, especially when you use a uh, chapsa where it's sweet, right? Uh, sweet glutinous rice uh, flour, I guess mm -hmm. you can use. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, definitely all the artisanal ones are. Nobody mm -hmm. adds uh, wheat uh, to gochujang mm -hmm. uh, unless it's mass produced. Tenjang, it's a little bit different because tenjang, a lot of people, even when it's made by hand, they add uh, barley mm. uh, because tenjang in itself is very salty. So what they sort of add some barley to neutralize it. And barley co uh, contains gluten, mm. unfortunately. Um, so when you buy tenjang, you do have to be careful to make sure that they didn't include barley. They can include other things, uh, right. but wheat is usually only reserved for the mass produced uh, tenjang. So make sure you buy something made by, you know, a small artisanal type of uh, place instead of a yeah. mass produced. Yeah. Because, right. you know, some of the, these tenjangs, they're seven, eight years old. And with time comes a lot of character, mm. a lot of character and a lot of probiotics. Great. And here's a question from Andy. I think he came from Twitter. He says, I love your cookbook. Um, are you, the Andy. recipes in the cookbook the same as the restaurant? I noticed the spicy rice cakes, which you guys mm -hmm. just talked about. Recipe is different than your YouTube spicy rice cakes re recipes. Um, so was there, what, what, when you were <laughs> writing the cookbook, was it different? Did you work um, on some of your my recipes, recipes are, tweaked it? My recipes are always different. Uh, mm -hmm. That tteokbokki, that rice cake recipe has changed at least seven times. So when I was making that video at that time, that's what I was using. Mm. And when I was, uh, when the book was close to coming to print, which was over a year ago, that's what I was using. And that's close to what I'm using now as well. You know, my menu doesn't change very often, but the technique and the recipes are always changing. Mm. And my cooks hate me for that, <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, just like any restaurant in New York City, you have to get better. You, you really have to get better all the time. And it's not about changing the menu items. It's mm -hmm. about making sure that the, the menu item that you put out is better than last year. And you know, I know my taste changes and I know I've grown older and I know my priorities and my values change and I want my food to change and grow with me. Great, and speaking of tteokbokki, uh, Fred asked, Huni, um, can you tell us if Korean street food had any influence on your cooking. And yes, I guess of course. The pokey was my first uh, taste memory that was, um, I don't remember restaurant, but I remember eating street the pokey. The, the color, the red color, the, the, the aroma, you know, you could just smell the, 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 the spice. Mm. Uh, and you can feel the spice, you know, I don't know if it's, if you feel it in the eyes <laughs> or your nose, uh, or your nasal passage, but um, yeah, that that energy of that Korean lady stirring that beautiful red, dark red slop of uh, rice cake and fish cake, um, and and I write in the book, um, I was given a choice, I was given one toothpick, and these days they sell it by the plate, but back then this was like 1976. Uh, I had a choice. I had to pick either a rice cake or a fish cake. What a dilemma for a four-year-old. And it was my first time, uh, but I chose the rice cake just like my cousins did. Um, yeah. Right. I had a lot to do with it. Yeah. I'm sure. Um, we do have a couple questions that brings us back to the present and mm -hmm. um, about the COVID-19 situation. Um, so Lee asks, what are some challenges that are specific to Korean restaurants in the US during the COVID-19 pandemic? Is there one or? Um, if, if this question was, is a uh, sort of touches on the racial bias. Um, I, I guess haven't she's experienced asking. It. Mm. Yeah, I haven't experienced it. And um, I, I know Chinese restaurants that have. 
Um, I know Koreatown is is a ghost town these days. I've never seen Koreatown. You know, it's actually there's more people. In, there were more people in Koreatown at 6 a.m. Uh, two months ago than there are now between 1 p.m. and 8 p.m. There's nobody there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know the reasons um, behind that, uh, but fortunately, you know, my restaurants aren't in Koreatown and, you know, my customers have been very supportive, very, very mm -hmm. supportive. Uh, so I don't think I'm the best person to be able to answer that question. Okay. Sorry. Sure. But that's fine. Um, we actually have a question from Eric Kim of Food52. Um, oh, okay. Kimchi and gochujang are now well-known food in America. What mm. lesser known Korean food do you think will be next in terms of popularity in the United States? Do you mm. think Perilla uh, Genip will ever gain popularity? Um, I think in New York, Perilla is slowly starting to gain popularity. Um, Perilla is weird though, because um, <laughs> you know there's good Perilla, there's Perilla that's been grown uh, naturally without pesticides uh, that have holes in it that you could buy at a farmer's market that to that tastes and, and feels so different. Mm. And then there's the, the mass produced like greenhouse perillas that they um, even sort of have in the winter time that they really have to just throw on a lot of pesticides because because perilla is very aromatic, bugs love it. So it's like the first green that they attack um, in the greenhouse. So perilla versus any other vegetable has a lot more pesticides. And because of the texture, it's very difficult to wash off pesticides from mm -hmm. perilla because it's almost hydroponic, almost. Um, so yes, I mean, perilla is one of those uh, ingredients that I think um, once you get used to it or once you have are exposed to it, people fall in love with. Um, I, I think I think chatgal, chatgal, which is fermented sort of um, fish, shrimp, or any kind of seafood, that is so important in dictating what your kimchi is going to taste like mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks from now. Um, I am studying chatgal right now, mm -hmm. and you know, it's an art. It's a it's a science. It's a passion. Uh, people who make good chakkal in Korea have been doing it for their entire lives and they're still studying it. And those are the people that I'm actually learning from. And that's one of these days when if, if Korean food becomes mainstream in this country, it will be because of chakkal. Um, really? It's so much natural umami in there. It's, right. you know, it's, you add a little bit of chakkal to anything and it tastes better. So yeah, hopefully. Hopefully, or you hopefully. can just have chakara and rice and call it a day too, yes. right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, I think I'm gonna bring Andrew back in um, for perhaps Andrew will have some finishing thoughts and last questions. I think, oh, Andrew, I think you're mute, so. How embarrassing, okay. <laughs> Uh, this is actually one more uh, question from someone who wrote in ahead of time. Uh, and I think it's a good question because it ties both into the book and I think um, into this, you know, unfortunate moment that we're all meeting in tonight around this pandemic. What's the thing about your, your work that you love the most? That I make people happy. Uh, and that it's easy for a chef to make people happy because they come to my restaurant seeking happiness. They want to be happy. They're willing to pay me money to <laughs> help them be happy. And it's easy. It's, it's easy if, if, if uh, we do it the right way. And for me, um, that's why I own restaurants. Hmm. That's great. Thank you. Um, if I, you said, uh, just if I could quickly, first of all, if you don't mind me mentioning, Jay, you mentioned at the top of the show, I do have a podcast. Mm -hmm. Uni and I, this is the second longest conversation yeah. I've ever had. The longest one we ever had was the first time we met, which was doing my show. Um, it is Andrew Talks to Chefs. And back in January of 2018, we did a nearly two hour biographical conversation. 
Mm. So if anybody wants the full Huni Kim life story, um, you can find that by going to any podcast platform. The other thing, I, my last comment before you close this out, Jay, is I just have to say, I've been, I've been collaborating on cookbooks and writing cookbooks for more than 20 years. I think this is such a great book. I mean, it's, 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 it's really rare that I'm as drawn in by a book as I was by this. Um, I am a huge fan of Huni's food. Um, I, I've been to Hanjan more than Danji, but I've been to Hanjan a, a lot, years. I never, I never presented myself. I never announced <laughs> myself. I'm sure Huni was in the back and I was in the dining room, but for years before we finally met two years ago, but this book to me just captures so, and explains what makes his food, uh, it makes him so special. So I can't recommend it enough to everyone out there. Um, and that's my, that's my closing thought. Thank you so much, Andrew. Great. Well, that's all we have for now. Thanks again to Chef Huni Kim and Andrew Friedman for joining us tonight. We wish you all the best and we sincerely hope, sincerely hope that we'll be able to visit your wonderful restaurants in the near future. But in the meantime, if you are in the city, order from Hanjin's family delivery service. And of course, you can also learn from his great recipes at home by ordering his book, My Korea. Um, our very special thanks to Peter, our IT director, for making this live webcast a possibility, and to our internet extraordinaire Gia for all you do for arts and culture programs. And of course, um, our thanks to you, our viewers, and our members. We hope you will join us again next week and the following weeks, as long as we do this. Um, check out what's coming up on our website at uh, koreasociety.org where you can sign up to receive our emails or join us as a member and stay healthy, everyone. Thank you so much. <laughs>